Welcome to our webinar on Managing Seasonal Risk in the Pastoral Zone, brought to you by Sheep Connect, South Australia, Natural Resources SA Murray-Darling Basin and SA Arid Lands. I want to give you a bit of context as to what is Sheep Connect. It's a project which provides practical opportunities for producers to be involved in making positive change to on-farm production and management practices, both in the pastoral and agricultural areas of South Australia. You can find out more about Sheep Connect SA at our website, sheepconnectsa.com.au, or you can follow us on Twitter. Sheep Connect would not be possible without the support of Australian Bull Innovation, Primary Industries and Regions South Australia, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, the South Australian Arid Lands NRM Board, and the South Australian Murray-Darling Basin NRM Board through funding from the Australian Government's local land, National Landcare Program and the NRM levies. Just like you to take a moment to read the disclaimer from the Government of South Australia. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the first of our panellists, James Walker. James is a producer from Camden Park Station at Longreach in Queensland. I first became aware of James's work with climate and managing seasonal risk as he is a climate champion. He was the Condinan Group 2017 Award for Excellence in Diversification recipient and at their Camden Park Station they run an agritourism venture. Thanks James. Yeah, thanks very much Jodie and thanks Pip uh, and it's a pleasure to talk to everybody tonight. Uh, it was a, yeah, an honour to be asked. I'm really interested about uh, weather and climate because it affects our farming systems. I just thought I'd start off by um, giving a bit of background. Uh, with, with our farming operation up here, we, you know, women and the ways uh, how we, we insist on going forward and decisions. So when I, when I sort of reflected and thought, well, how can I capture that? Uh, we make our decisions in terms of production, finance and, and and climate through lenses uh, that, that we use sort of to make a decision. And so I just sort of captured this. It's a combination of uh, and, uh, and knowledge sharing, I suppose, but, uh, but ultimately there are a lot of lenses that make a decision. So the reason why the lenses are so important for us is because uh, in, in sort of researching and having a look at, at Australian farming production, I came across this quote that says farming agriculture has the highest income variability of any of the OECD countries um, uh, in in the world, and that was quoted by Abares in 2012. So, so the reason for that income variability is the is the seasonal variability as well. And, and I suppose when you look at business, business the, the language of business is accounting, and the language of farming is, is water or rainfall. So weather and climate as well. So, so really, you know, we need to really capture as much information and foresight as we can on weather and climate. So in terms of uh, the climate and weather lens, I suppose analyze when, you, when you're looking forward and, and there's the, the long-term weather for the seasonal weather, uh, which is sort of monthly. And then you've got the, uh, I suppose the, the, the direct weather, which is the daily and the weekly. So we'll always analyze, analyze where we're up to with that and, and actually lean on the Bureau of Meteorology. I thought we'd do would just be do a bit of a, a weather and climate audit, you know, that surrounds our decisions and our decisions are broken up into is, is land purchases, water infrastructure, uh, strategic production decisions and also tactical production business and farming. Context we're operating you can see here they've got fairly robust um, uh, you know rainfall dependencies so they don't really uh, lean on our weather forecast as much as we do in Australia because ours over here is is on so so when we first came across from the UK uh, we adopted the farming systems which is annual production systems that are repeatable and and uh, you can just tweak and, and rely on that production and there's still some of it here in the traditional uh, farming systems but what we've more adapted to is the, the rainfall variability and for that uh, like a business system that is is quite agile so so when we have a look at the uh, our businesses we have to always remember that we are in very highly variable rainfall areas uh well a common world and, and uh, so our production moved to the season moved to the available um opportunities we've got on the ground so what i thought i'd just sort of uh I'd just show you a little bit of context and and uh uh, in Longreach, we've got uh, not not bad bandwidth, and and uh, I've always had sort of an appreciative inquiry about how external factors affect your decisions. And so, in land or uh, of your farming assets, you can you can sort of uh, have a look at a few different maps. And and this is one here that's uh, quite 
quite telling. The red is the most variable uh, within Australia and the white is the most consistent rainfall. So you can see our, our spot is pretty much between those two red circular sort of um, polygons there. Uh, we're right smack bang in the middle up here. Uh, so anyway, so that's uh, one of the maps I sort of have a look at. We, I know uh, I've shared this with some of the producers uh, and some of the big partial companies and they've actually sold assets based because of the rainfall. So yeah, so it doesn't mean that you're going to get high levels like in the consistent uh, uh, low, uh, or it might be consistently high, but it's just more consistent than these areas out here. So, uh, so yeah, so when you're about to see what, what production you've got to stack up, uh, not to say that, uh, that you can't, uh, perform really well in a, in a highly variable area because you've got more opportunities to buy and sell if you look after your, your grass and your, and your, and your feed and your, so what I thought was, uh, you know, just to take uh, a, a stance and say, all right, well, what can we control? We, you know, we can control the infrastructure, uh, just depending on how we spend our capital. This is a 60,000 acre property. And the, all the blue dots are all the uh, dams on this, on this station. And all the, uh, and all the troughs are, are, are the red there. So, so as you can see, um, you know, if, if the, if there's a bit of silt build up in the dams, they become boggy and, you, and you've got to move your stock away from those dams. So we thought, well, if we've got a highly variable season, we're not always going to get consistent land water flow. So what we did was we designed a water system that could, that could handle, I suppose, um, uh, when, when we had a high abundance of grass and we had low amounts of water, uh, at least we could use this system to support animals in the, uh, uh, in, in the grazing system that we had. So, so that's what we did, just to take out, I suppose, the um, uh, you know the vulnerability of, of being held to account for rainfall. We just decided to to uh, to develop that. So they're all two kilometre water system uh, water radiuses, and uh, yeah, we increased our performance of productivity, especially when the cycle was against us. We could restock earlier and uh, and hold more. If we had a high abundance of feed, we could really really stock up. And uh, yeah, and if uh, and we uh, we usually had our animals a bit healthier and, and more availability of grass and be able to rotate them. So, so that's just something can, to consider. And what I'm just sort of going through is some decision points and you might have more in the question and answer section. So, so yeah, I'd love to share any uh, ideas that, that you guys have on what decisions you can make. So this is the water infrastructure that we put in. We just 75 mil poly uh, reticulated and pressurized. And uh, that's just sort of the flow rate and the troughs there. We got up to, five litres a second in some of the troughs and uh, down to down to two litres in uh, uh, across the board. So uh, so I suppose some of the strategic uh, production decisions when you sort of have a look at, uh, have a look at, uh, uh, you know, setting a strategy for the year coming up, uh, the best thing to do is just to audit, I suppose, what the weather systems are going to be like. Uh, a lot of people sort of lean on their bank balance and their repayments, required repayments, interest repayments and, and obligations there. But ultimately things can go uh, pretty, uh, you know, pretty uh, tragically wrong if, if we get that balance wrong. So I, I always sort of look at the weather first and then make the decisions and then adapt to that. So in 2012, I was, I had access to a, a I suppose a dynamic system of weather forecasting and it's called POAMA. So they use current uh, I suppose gauges and meters to determine the forecast and you can see here uh, this is the current one uh, this year so you can see here that's where we are now where that green dot starts and there are all the models all the various models around the world and that that generate the forecast and that's the I suppose the mean in the middle of all those forecasts aggregated so this is determining the La Nina and the El Nino for our El Nino for our area. So, so yeah, so I, I have a good look at that to see whether or not there's some real, uh, real conviction either way and whether it's, uh, you know, shaping up to be an El Nino or, or a La Nina year. And that determines our northern wet season and, uh, and the uh, onshoring rain. So, so yeah, so that's what I sort of have a, have a, have a bit of a hard look at. And, and later on, we might be able to um, hear from uh, the Bureau of Meteorology about, you know, what, what's more appropriate for your area down there. So, so when uh, in 2012, when we had the, the biggest 
uh, the start of the biggest drought and the largest national herd. I had a look at this and, and uh, it was, it was uh, trending, I suppose, uh, from a La Nina to an El Nino, but it was still in a neutral phase in that white band in the middle. So, uh, so that was one lens I looked at. I thought, well, we've already had sort of four or five good years and we bailed a lot of hay in, in that period because we just had incredible grass stocks. So, so, uh, so I had a look at that and then I had a look at the national herd and, and it was really, uh, really at its highest. And uh, you could tell that also by people sort of not buying females anymore and, and uh, uh, restocking with females because their paddocks are pretty full. So I just thought, well, when we were in, in Western Australia doing a trial with, the, with this system, I had a look at uh, uh, the national herd, looked at this again, and I thought, well, maybe it'd be best to uh, just liquidate the cattle that we had, keep the sheep uh, just in case it does get dry because we've got a different browse profile. And, uh, and if it did actually, in fact, rain, the market wouldn't go that high because the national herd was at its greatest. But if it did go dry, uh, there would have been a, a huge, I suppose, um, oversupply of cattle, a bottleneck, and the market would have gone down. And so, so it was a bit of a gamble because this was only in a trial phase, but I just sort of looked at all the historical maps and, and looked at this as well and thought, well, uh, you know, there's not much downside if we sell uh, and buy back in, but there is if we hold on and, and uh, try and compete to sell with everybody else. So, so that was the decision we sort of made there. And, and so you can see this is the uh, contrast in seasons we get up here. And this is uh, 2010 and 2013. So, so yeah, it's incredible. One year up here, our average is, uh, well, our average is 18 inches, but I've experienced two and a half inches one year and then 42 inches another year, not directly after each other, but uh, different times in the last 20 years. So, so yeah, to stack up a production system that you can repeat on, that's quite hard. So, so yeah, so we've sort of diversified a bit and by selling down our cattle, we could diversify and, and uh, we put a solar farm in. Uh, we were just uh, looking for opportunities and, and uh, this came up. So this was taken about a week ago. They just uh, hooked it up and uh, it's all about sort of being agile in our business and, and working with the weather instead of trying to force our production system down its throat, I suppose. So it's a 15 megawatt system and will power about 10,000 homes. Uh, and when we've got available grass, we usually capture it. So we sell, sell a lot of hay. We sort of did about 75,000 bales when, uh, when the cattle prices uh, moved up prior to 2012. We just uh, thought we'd, uh, yeah, capture the grass and bale it and sell it. So, yeah, so we sold, sold a fair bit of hay, sold some down to South Australia Territory and all around Queensland. So built sheds and, and did that. So again, just being agile, I suppose. And so, they're the sort of the strategic production decisions and then you come down to the tactical. So, um, so this is, uh, this is what I sort of look at and, um, uh, and I was in sale yards in 2008, I suppose, uh, down at Roma and, and I had access to this, this weather um, pattern here. And it's not so much that um, I was given access to them, I was just sort of looked and found, found them. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a weather system uh, called WX Maps, and, and uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with it. So you can see here what, and this is interesting for the South Australian application uh, tonight, you can see there the cloud band sweeping up. And this is uh, daily weather forecast. Uh, uh, so yeah, so you can sort of see how the patterns are evolving and, and what the likelihood it is. And then you look at this and then you look at a few others and just see, uh, see what the likelihood of, of that is. And you can see here, this, this actual, the start of this one wraps all the way around and hits New Zealand. And uh, yeah, look at that rain towards the end of this week over there. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, I just sort of have a look at that and tactical decisions might be uh, to bring more sheep in and, and shed uh, before shearing or, or earlier harvest or, or planting or, you know, what, whatever it might be. But, uh, but that's sort of what I look at there. Uh, that's the seven day forecast and, and what you've also got here is a, a of us don't know about and there's a probability and then there's a skilling behind that probability and so yeah so obviously you just got to look at your cash flow um, and manage that through 
through seasonal variability, um, and uh, and that's another another element that that I that I sort of like to look at, um, and also just benchmark your performance against um, you know against yourself pretty much. That's the most valuable way, and uh, yeah, just keep monitoring your business. So here's some other sort of tools that I use, and then so I just wanted to sort of uh, you know let the participants and audience uh, reflect on the lenses that they use to make a decision and just sort of clarify exactly what they are, whether it's family, whether it's, um, you know, pressures of finance or, or, or the uh, hope of expanding, you know, what, you know, what lenses you sort of use to reflect and make decisions, I suppose, for your, your own business uh, is, is very important to consider. And uh, so mine are pretty much uh, production, weather and financial, uh, and that's three, but there's a, there's a lot more, but I'm just trying to pull all those together so so we can uh, yeah so we can uh, uh, perform a little bit better. There's a, a lot more that goes into that, but um, but they're the they're the uh, high level ones. So I you know actually you consider yours. Uh, this is a current map on the uh, May to July uh, rainfall, so it's pretty bleak. Um, I'll be from my point of view, I'll be uh, fattening as much uh, the sheep as much as I can uh, to get them in a good good position uh, so that if I can see uh, if I can see a, a peak in the market or a spike in the market around sort of June I might I might actually um, pull the trigger on, on some of those sheep and just sort of reduce the stocking numbers a bit in that time I think there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of sheep and cattle come onto the market and things will probably you know sort of decline a little bit so it's probably a good opportunity to find some adjustment or some lease country with good good stock reserves there to, to be able to uh you know keep the cash flow coming in but but yeah so that's uh that's uh that's what um that's what it looks like at the moment so in south australia i suppose uh if you look at the scale there uh yeah it's a chance of exceeding median rainfall so there could be chances of isolated thunderstorms and showers and might be quite lucky to to get under those, but uh, but that's just uh, I suppose the uh, the you know the quality of the lens you look through and and how you balance all the all the different lenses. That's it for me. So um, I'll just hand back over to Jody. And, and again, welcome. I welcome any questions or uh, if anyone wants to get in contact or or uh, uh, have a chat, that'd be great. I um, really keen to do that. And I just implore everyone to get a good relationship with their local bureau meteorology representative. It's been great that. Barnaby or the federal government uh, actually reinstated an agricultural arm of the Bureau of Meteorology. So, uh, so they're they're in, uh, I suppose charged to support us and our farming uh, pursuits. So, so it's great. So, really looking forward to hearing the next part of the conversation. I'll hand this back over. Thanks, James. Great presentation. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, Pip. I'll let you fire off with a couple of first questions. I've got a couple here too. Thanks, Jode. Um, all right, yeah, the, the first one I've got here is to, after it rains, do you allow for fresh seed set? Yeah, definitely. You've got it, yeah. So, uh, so when, well, when, we're de when we've been destocked, we just, uh, yeah, um, yeah, we just delayed restocking for as long as we could. Uh, and, uh, and when we did restock, we just keep rotating the animals so that they, um, they don't, uh, you know, damage the, uh, you know, damage the the grass stocks or or damage the the seed. We've got a, I suppose we've got a lot of, uh, I suppose, competitive grazing up here, which is, which is, uh, you know, kangaroos and and emus and things like that come through. So we've just exclusion fenced our place, so we've got a six foot high fence around the whole property, and we split it up internally as well, so we've got better control over that grass, and that's just an infrastructure decision again. Uh, based on the, on being able to control the grass that we've got. Thanks. I'll um, I'll throw to Jody, and you can ask one, Jode. Um, James had a question from someone about your baling your hay. Do you own your own equipment, or do you get contractors in to do that for you? Well, that's the thing. So uh, we had we had an opportunity to buy our own, but you just don't know how many seasons back to back you're going to get. So we just contracted it and uh, negotiated a price. I think it was eighteen dollars to bale it. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, we were selling it for sort of ar around that sort of fifty dollar mark. Uh, it's a lot higher than that now because it's there's a lot less about. But but yeah, I just I I just 
I just like that that business model to be able to to do that. It's very very clean and easy, but you just need to be able to. They say, well, hay in a shed is as good as money in a bank, but uh, but yeah, you have to get it to the shed and dodge the storm, so you've got quality. Uh, but yeah, certainly, I just I just would have had machines sitting there and uh, you know for the last five years, um, and you could have sold them, but I you know I'd suggest that uh, you know I'm not specialised in in bailing more so than uh, yeah than just managing the grass and yeah so. That, that was our decision, uh, but if you're in a, you know a bit more of a a uh, an area where you might get contract work outside of that, it might be worthwhile doing. But yeah, we we didn't. Thanks, James. The other question was about over the period of time um, and the investment that you made in your water infrastructure. How long a period of time did you take to do to put that infrastructure in, and um, and the associated work with that? Our strategy with that was uh, just to get a property property plan, like get a map first to see what we wanted to do. And then we just broke it up in a bite-sized chunk. So we had uh, a vision on what we wanted to do, but we just sort of had steps, uh, a step approach to, to doing it. So I think the first uh, the first reticulation we did was 10 kilometres. And, uh, and that was great because we did that all ourselves. So grading, uh, trenching, uh, laying the poly out, poly welding, joining, putting the troughs in, concreting the, the pads. I think we did 36 troughs and 63 kilometres of poly. Uh, and... Uh, and yeah, so so over time, I think it was about sort of uh, yeah, it was close to a quarter of a million dollars uh, that we that we invested in. But uh, with the improved productivity, I think the payback was about two years on that. So uh, so that that was quite a good um, a good an investment, and it just it just gave you that security as well, uh, and uh, yeah, and allowed you to run your business a little bit uh, better. So yeah, so it was. It was that, and and you'll find that uh, if if your timing's right, there might be some government subsidies, and I know there's some concessional loans through uh, through New South Wales and, and Queensland at the moment. Uh, so I'm not sure in South Australia. I'd suggest there would be. Uh, I'm not sure, Joe. You'd know more about that than me. Yeah, it's. Um Water infrastructure is probably best to refer that back to the natural resources um, area that you live in um, and um, just check with them about the regulations and um, any information associated with that water infrastructure. Yeah, great great advice, Jody. Um, we've got one here that's come in, James, in regards to what extent does the impact of wild dogs play in your planning and what effect does it have on stocking management? Yeah, so we, we, we're probably ahead of the curve a little bit. Uh, Long Ridge was quite lucky in that uh, we just sort of got the uh, got the start of the wild dogs and then uh, uh, and then we, you know, the Queensland government thought, well, we want to protect the sheep industry. So uh, so they, they, they invested some funds out here uh, to, and I think it was 40% of the cost of putting an exclusion fence up. So, so some of us are lucky to, to get access to that, but it's about eight thousand dollars a kilometre, and uh, I just think it's uh, it's extremely worthwhile to do to be able to protect your sheep. And we're running a uh, research trial on accelerated lambing at the moment, so uh, five lambs in three years. So we just needed that control, and and uh, wild dogs would have not given us control at all. We would have had uh, pretty pretty bad results, I'd imagine, but. Some people have experienced down to 20% lambing with wild dogs and they're back up to around 100, 110% uh, after the fence. So, so yeah, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a big cost, but, uh, but yeah, if, if, uh, if you're really serious about sheep production, yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's very worthwhile. Um, and people were very worried. I think there's 5,000 kilometers up here at the moment of exclusion fence. So James, this is along the same lines and, and it's talking about the exclusion zones and do you favour the honeycomb exclusion zone or the much larger open zones? There is much talk in WA as to the benefits of one over another. Yeah, certainly. So we, we had a <coughs> so we had a, a proposal to government uh, which was fencing off the shires. So, uh, so it was uh, three shires and we we're just going to put a, a big fence all the way around it. And so uh, so a few people got involved and, and yeah, it was quite contentious because a lot of people invest a lot of time into getting a, a regional approach. Uh, but, um, uh, but that fell over because, uh, they believed in cluster fencing. So it's individual properties or, or a combination of three or four properties fencing together. 
that that got up, that was successful, and and the government ended up funding that because it was sort of getting producers to work together within a like a fairly uh, you know smaller area, and that way we could combat them a, a, a lot better. But in that in that open area, uh, it you know it's very although there wouldn't be the density of dogs on the inside as what there are on the outside, there's still a lot of a lot of dogs in there and. Uh, and in one year, in uh, on a friend's place, he's got eighty thousand acres. Uh, he fenced it off, and three years later, he's still getting dogs out of that uh, eighty thousand acres. Uh, so, so yeah, so they breed up, and they uh, and they do, and some in some cases they do get through the fence. But uh, the smaller the area, the easier it is con to control. So, uh, so odd, yeah. So it's very contentious, but. Uh, but somebody said to me once, uh, why don't you test it, James? Why don't you get a white chook and fence a 10 by 10 off, put it right in the middle of the dingo zone and see see how long that chook survives for. And uh, anyway, I thought, well, yeah, that'd be quite telling uh, just to see, you know, uh, how how robust those fences are. But, but yeah, that's the way they approach it up here and they've had great successes. So I could share a map with you guys on, on, uh, on the current, current fencing that's happened up here and it's quite uh, incredible how quickly it's all gone up. And so James is that the same with other pests as well you know in the way of roos or whatever other than than just dogs? Uh, yeah so uh, I suppose the exclusion fence uh, helps you control your your um, competitive grazing uh, animals as well like your kangaroos so it stops the flow of them you know so instead of getting you know 500 moved through your place uh, in a couple of weeks uh, you know they don't so uh, so yeah and traditionally out here there weren't many kangaroos because there wasn't much water so when you come to a drought they sort of just really wreck the land and if you get a little shower they'll actually rip the roots out and eat those of the, of the grass so it's really damaging and uh, yeah and from from my point of view you know we want a balance there we don't want uh, you know all of a sudden 50,000 kangaroos on, on, our, on our place but we you know we do want some here just to uh, just to have a balance so yeah so it sort of control gives you a little bit of control that way as well it just depends on how many kangaroos are there at the time at your fence so uh, yeah, so it's a pretty it's a pretty good tool at the moment, especially for preserving your, your feed stocks. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker this evening, um, Darren Ray. Darren's the senior meteorologist at the Bureau of Meteorology, and many of you would be familiar with his um, voice, with his sessions on ABC um, and other appearances on TV and and the radio. So over to Darren to present our second session. Great, thanks, thanks, Jody. Lovely, thank you. All right. Um, okay, so the as um, as Jody mentioned, I'm based in India, uh, senior meteorologist, to be of meteorology, and climatologist. Um, started in 2002. Um, did a bit, did five years of short-term forecasting, and then got got interested in longer-term stuff. So the climate influences and um, and seasonal outlook information. Um, I've been in Adelaide a while now. It was interesting talking to Jane because for, from Longreach because uh, my grandparents were from Tambo which is about 100 k's down the road and they spent, they spent a fair bit of time working out on cattle properties um, and mum was born out that way but she moved moved further east so I was actually born out, out over, over near Toowoomba um, so yeah um, Queensland boy originally but been in Adelaide a while so what I'm going to look at um, is uh, so what sort of places you can go to to grab information about what's been happening. Uh, I'll talk about the major climate influences that impact impact Australia. So what drives some of that variability that James was talking about and how you can actually use our outlook information and seasonal forecast information to pick, um, as James was doing, um, just pick some of those, what direction things are going in. So you can actually use some of that information in the way that James is doing to um, to actually make the best some some uh, decisions that um, help help steer your profits in the right direction and um, look after your your infrastructure. So I'll also touch on a bit of weather forecast information as well. And so on the way through, we'll get to uh, what does the what does the outlook look like for the rest of 2018. So currently, uh, if you want to look at what's been happening, we've actually got a fair bit of stuff on our website. So Feel free to go and explore those links. We've got maps of rainfall and temperatures, 
um, and things like NDVI, so satellite derived vegetation indexes. Um, so you can look at those on a, on a you know, monthly, some daily, weekly, annual time frame. Um, we've got Climate Data Online is that tool if you want to drag out, say, rainfall or temperature data of the closest station to you, go on to Climate Data Online on our climate and past weather page. Um, we've also got a fair bit of new weather data. So we've been the government's charges to gather together um, water information across the country. So it's like creek, creek gaugings and river gaugings. And, and um, so what's been happening so far? This is, so this is using some of the maps that you can get off our website. So 2018 so far, it's been a bit, a bit of a generally a fairly dry story across southeastern Australia, sort of northwest, western northwest parts of the country. Um, but the other, I guess, the interesting stories is, is um, uh, basically those very warm temperatures, very much warmer than average temperatures across uh, across a fair bit of um, fair bit of sort of eastern and central central Australia. Uh, so it's been been pretty warm. It was you know, people would remember it switched over sort of mid January. Had a particularly hot spell through till about sort of early mid February. Um, sort of got a little bit milder for a bit there. Then we've, we actually had our warmest April on record for South Australia. Uh, just um, we just ran the stats in the last few days. Um, so yeah, warm, dry. Um, that's sig just that signal of a little bit wetter in the west. Um, it's just something we've been seeing happening uh, through the last few months. Um, so tending to be a little bit wetter out in the sort of out in the northwest pastoral areas. Um, so there's April rainfall. So you know, in particular for cropping farmers or just anyone trying to get some new growth, pasture growth coming through. Um, there's not been a lot of rainfall around. It's really, um, we're really limited to um, probably the lower southeast and really some sort of parts of the mountain lefty ranges that have had enough enough rainfall um, in the last sort of month or so to actually get some new um, new new green growth um, go, getting going. And yeah, so it's been been certainly quite dry um, across the southeast. This is some output from a modelling as a sort of landscape water balance modelling system that we've been running called Aura L. So you know. Um, I'll, I'll show you a bit later on where this is on the website. It's a five kilometer resolution model that's the diagram on the left there shows the various things that are being modeled um, in the modeling system. So it models changes in the amount of rainfall coming in, solar radiation, and uh, how much evapotranspiration occurs, what happens to the changes in soil moisture through different layers, um, and, uh, and also calculates things like runoff and that sort of thing as well. And so if you look at the map on the right, it's just showing it's, it's quite a bit drier than average for this time of year um, across a fair bit of southeastern Australia with that combination of hot and dry conditions. So it's a bit of an interesting tool that you can actually look at what's going on in a fairly, um, across, a more sort of, uh, across the larger scale. In terms of current climate influences or climate influences that impact, impact um, Australia and South Australia, um, so a lot of people would have heard of El Nino, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, is the name for this pattern of variability in the Pacific Ocean that happens on a year-to-year -year basis. And um, in the neutral neutral phase, you get this um, the trade winds blowing water, warm water warmed up by the sun across uh, across the Pacific, piles up a little bit in the Western Pacific. Um, you tend to get increasing cloud moisture where the warm water is. That that those winds feed into the Walker circulation, which is that loop over the top, and then they those the winds then feed back into the trade winds again. Um, that's sort of what happens normally. So you've got trade winds blowing on the equator. In La Nina events, we see strengthening trade winds and we tend to see the warm water pushed more around northern Australia and that increases the moisture availability and cloud and the air tends to rise up more, and so it's more conducive to forming rainfall. And once again, once that, once what's going on in the oceans feeds back in the atmosphere, locks in, they lock into each other and kick off into an event, La Nina event, which can last for nine to 12 months. And so La Nina events typically start off June, July, August, um, and then go through till April or so the following year before they, they die off and go back to neutral. Um, so you tend to get wetter and cooler conditions, particularly winter, spring, and into summer in La Nina's. In El Nino's, the opposite phase, uh, you see the trade winds weaken and the warm water tends to stay more in the central and eastern Pacific, it tends to get cooler than average around Australia. And so we get reduced cloud forming, reduced moisture availability. And also the walker circulation breaks down because the air is tending to rise up more in the central and eastern Pacific. It tends to sink down more over Australia and that tends to inhibit rainfall formation as well. So once again, El Nino's and Nino start off in June, July, August, go through to about April or May the following year. So in terms of years that might stand out, 2010, late 2010 into 2011, strong La Nina. Um, El Nino's, we've got 82, 2006, um, 2015 uh, were all year, El Nino years. 
uh, moderate to strong El Nino years. And I guess the other point is, you can see the link there on the bottom. Um, when there's not much going on, we, we update the status of things, what's going on once a month. But when there's an event going on, like an El Nino or a El Nino event happening, we, we update, uh, we produce these reports online every fortnight that you can put your email in and email into and subscribe to to get the latest updates, what's happening. So in terms of impacts, the impacts, I've got the rainfall, rain, well, the impacts of La Nina on the left-hand side. So rainfall on the top left, the temperature on the bottom left. So we tend to see increased rainfall um, across particularly the eastern parts and northern parts of Australia. It does impact South Australia, not quite as strongly as um, Queensland, New South Wales, the Northern Territory. Um, you do tend to get cooler winter springs and summers in La Niña's. El Niño is on the right, um, slightly different pattern. It's not completely mirror image opposites, but um, tend to get drier conditions in eastern states in El Niño years. And you tend to get hotter conditions as well. So that's when you tend to see, you know, warmer springs. So you tend to see earlier starts of the fire season and, you know, increased numbers of extreme fire weather days. Uh, it tends to be drier through, drier and hotter in spring. Um, now we also run, on average, both El Niños and La Nina's occur on average about every four to seven years. When you get an El Niño, there is about a 50% chance that the year after will be a, a La Nina event so it, uh, after a moderate or strong El Niño. So that's, there is a little bit of, predictability and connection in between the two, but it's not, a, it's not a perfect cycle going from one to the other. We run ocean modelling um, that looks at what's what's going on, and I'll show you some of the output, uh, output out, what, what, how you can use that for um, looking at what's expected to happen through through the year coming, through the year ahead, um, by looking at that ocean, ocean atmosphere modelling of, of, of El Nino and La Nina events. So, so bearing in mind the stronger impact on the eastern states of El Nino and La Nina, um, the Indian Ocean Dipole is uh, is a bit more is another is another interesting influence that's a bit more applicable to South Australia. It's a bit less applicable to to James's part of the world. Um, it's, it's a pattern of variability in the northern Indian Ocean. It's sort of similar to El Niño La Nina, um, but it's actually, actually got a shorter time period. So you can see these patterns of variability that that start off around about sort of May June July. And they go through to October before they get they die off typically during November. And in the negative phase, what we call negative phase, you tend to see warmer than average water right to the northwest of Australia, and it gets cooler near Africa. They actually get droughts in East Africa, and we get increased rainfall and moisture, um, and it tends to get wetter and, and, and milder through through winter and spring. There was a really strong one, quite a strong one in 2016. So that's that's really the major climate influence that was around. Um, through that year, a couple of years ago, and it was a positive phase in 2015. So positive phase, um, what we mean by positive is we look at the difference from average, difference from average ocean temperatures near Africa, difference from average near, near Australia, northwestern Australia, we take away the two and we get a value. And when it's strongly positive values, that's reflecting we, we're getting cool and average temperatures uh, to northwestern Australia and warmer than near, in, near Africa. So positive doesn't mean positive in the sense it's good, it means positive in the sense of positive values of the IAD. Um, so negatives actually is a good phase in terms of rainfall and milder conditions. So, and you can get, um, so I'll talk about the influence of the impacts of in the ocean dipole. So negative phase on the left, the wetter and milder phase for temperatures. And you can see the impact is more across, a little bit more across central Australia into the southeast rather than um, across the eastern states for rainfall, those purple blue areas are wetter conditions and milder temperatures through winter and spring, um, generally in negative IOD. And that's certainly what we saw in 2016. That event started off in May, went through and, was, uh, went through and um, would died off by about mid-November in 2016. Positive events um, quite strongly focused in terms of impacts on, on South Australia and Northern Territory for, um, for, for rainfall in terms of those drier conditions in the positive IOD and uh, warmer temperatures as well. And once again, they also do occur once to about every four to seven years on average. Now you can get combinations of El Nino, positive IOD, uh, linear and negative IOD as well. And I've got a couple of slides here that just show, explore that a little bit. So um, 
bear with me a little bit here. I've grabbed Cooper PD rainfall and grabbed the April to October totals and the November to March totals. And I've just coloured each year through the time series from 1900 through to the, through to, uh, the latest available, um, according to the climate influence that was around in that year. So we've got La Nina's years on their own in the light blue, La Nina and negative ID together in the dark blue. And we've got El Nino's on their own in the brown, positive ID on their own in the orange, and then El Nino and positive ID together in the red, uh, and neutral years just in the grey there. So you can see the variability year to year um, and through even multi decadal periods. So the 1950s through to the 70s were a, uh, a bit of a wetter period, and then it dried out a little bit through the sort of late 70s through to late, late 90s started getting a few more La Nina events happening during the 2000s. Um, now, it sort of pops out a little bit more um, if you sort those by value. So basically what I've just done is you grab all those and you just sort them by rainfall amount, keeping the colouring, and it just sort of pops out a little bit more in terms of some of the influence. So April to October, the, on the top line there, you can see that the wetter years are basically your years, negative ID years, all the two together. Um, so these green and and tend to be dark blues. There are a few. There's one or two El Ninos and um, positive ID positive ID years in there in the above median rainfall. But if you look down the drier end of things, you know if you've got a if you've got a positive ID or an El Nino or all the two together. Um, there's a pretty good chance that that's going to be drier conditions in April to October. It's not as clear in November to March which is slightly unfortunate. Um, you know, that's, there's really not a strong sort of spread there, um, strong indications of, of um, influence from the, from the climate drivers, apart from possibly the, the green years where you see the negative ID, despite the fact that it's typically over by November, um, what, what's going on in the oceans looks like it still has influence on rainfall that carries on through through November to March from for almost all of them. Uh, so I'm going to just mention quickly this 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 is a bit of a newish um, climate influence called the Madden Julian Oscillation, and it's um, pretty important one for the time of period of year that we've just sort of come out of. Um, in terms of, it's uh, basically a pattern of pattern of tropical activity, bursts of tropical activity, and rainfall that move along the equator from near Africa, and they move move across. They're confined by the by the equator um, in terms of where their, their pattern of movement. They move across, move along the equator from Africa, approach northern Australia, and then move across northern Australia, and then head off into the Pacific Ocean over about a four to six week cycle. And so there's different phases that have been identified. So we run these analysis and the phase one to three is when it's moving across the Indian Ocean. Phase four and five when it gets, to, gets north of Australia. And that's when it injects more moisture into the atmosphere and more cloud. If there's a weather system around that can capture that, so we're looking for a, like a, low, low, a cold front or, a, or an ex-tropical cyclone, that sort of thing, um, that can capture that increased moisture can lead to the sort of rainfall event that we're seeing on the on the map on the bottom right. So you can get a sort of, you know, that's where you tend to sort of get your widespread summer and into autumn widespread rain events, um, as often associated with, with bursts of this Madden Julian oscillation. Now, the beauty thing is we can actually forecast this with reasonable degrees of accuracy out about out to about uh, out to about a four four weeks ahead. So when there's a strong burst of this showing up, and it's and it's forecast to move through phase four and five, you can say well. In that week, there's an increased chance of getting significant rainfall happening. So it's um, it's certainly something I, I have been watching pretty closely through the last uh, through the last few months, and it's been hasn't been super super active this year so far. The last sort of significant event was really in late November, early early uh, December, and that produced that rainfall that we can see in the map on the, the bottom right there. Um, so yeah, what does this all mean? What are we seeing for the rest of the year? Um, so in terms of the short term, so talking about the next seven days ahead, and, and James gave us a bit of some indications of what's going on at the moment. Um, go and have a look at the MedEye tool um, in terms of the seven day forecast information. Um, and that's got the uh, six kilometer resolution. It's about to be up, it's gonna be upgraded to much higher resolution shortly. Um, there's an app which links into the same, same forecast database uh, that you can download as well for free. And 
And you can also look at the, the tool on the m.bum.gov.au site as well. And so you can get seven day head forecasts um, and look at all sorts of different information on that tool. So it's a, um, and, there's, there's, and the app has got different features on it. You can look at the radar, you can look at the seven day forecasts, you can drill down into particular days and see, see what's going to be happening on sort of on three hour time steps, a bit, bit of what the app looks like. And James, James sort of touched on, there is a bit of rainfall forecast um, coming across, actually starting probably about midnight tonight um, in Adelaide and then moving across, um, across the southern parts of the state at the moment. So um, if you remember back to the April rainfall maps, there's not been much in the way of significant rainfall uh, since pro possibly probably early early December really um, with that MJO event. This is this is not a bad system. There's actually a little bit of weak MJO activity going across at the moment. Just seeing a little bit of weak phase four or five activity feeding moisture into this system that we're seeing coming through at the moment. Um, and we'll see some areas that we'll probably get it along the southern southern agricultural areas that might end up with sort of 25 to 30 millimeters. Um, but for actually a lot of lot of the uh, lot of areas, it's really going to be more a uh, maybe a five to ten rainfall millimeter rainfall event. And then if you look at the map on the right, um, the forecast out through to about you know, late next week, um, really we're seeing high pressure systems starting to dominate the uh, dominate the weather patterns again throughout to at, at mid May. And overall, May May is looking fairly dry. Um, I might just duck out to the website now. So this is the Bureau's homepage there. I'm hoping everyone can see that okay. And a couple of things on there. So we've got the MedEye tool that I, I was showing in there. So you, you can click into that and uh, put put in your location that you're interested in. So uh, so there's the forecast maximum minimum temperatures. You click on a day, you can get the winds, wind speeds and directions. Through the, and the temperatures through the day. Uh, we've got the rainfall maps, so chance of any rainfall through through a day. So you just zoom out, zoom in and out. So there's likely to be, it's pretty likely to be some, like a, well, you know, there's some likelihood of getting some rainfall uh, on Thursday. Not much on Friday, and then it sort of disappears. So pretty much for okay for for, for William Creek. Um, in terms of, so that's the chance of any rainfall, and then if you look at the how much rainfall could happen, and there's not much showing up, so there's some areas that sort of have got a 50% likelihood of getting one to five millimetres, um, and there's a 25% chance of getting quite a bit more than that across some parts of Australia, but it's not really pushing up into the pastoral areas. In any sort of um, in any sort of strength. Um, so back to the home page, and we've got got the satellite images, we've got the rain radars. So there's Woomera, Woomera radar showing a bit of mid-level stuff off to the south. So um, this is this is quite high-based sort of middle-level cloud activity going on. And we can also look at satellite imagery. So we're going to look at the satellites and obviously hoping you've, particularly for this one, you probably need a decent internet connection to be, to be looking at this. But one of the big things with this, with this, with this event, we've added, added uh, satellite data in there. So you can actually and loop this on a 10 minute update. And so you can actually see where, where thunderstorm activity is developing. Um, and, and how that's tracking, whether it's coming near your part of the world. But I have to, it's fair to say this one will stress your internet connection. Okay, um, so that's just sort of some short term weather information. So in terms of the outlook, this is the landscape water balance modeling system that I mentioned earlier. If you want to play around with that. So you can look at the difference from average, get a time series of different locations for, for whatever things, whatever, what are you interested in looking at there? So, um, in terms of rainfall forecast on the agriculture page, we have got these forecast rainfall maps, just which are a little bit similar to some of the ones that James is showing. Got a total, total forecast rainfall, and you look at the four day time steps. So, you can look, so obviously, the next few days we've got that rainfall over the sort of southern agricultural areas and southern pastoral, and then it just disappears a bit. 
So overall, over the eight days, you know, some areas are going to receive, and um, look like they could actually get that sort of 25 millimetres or so to kick off the cropping season, but not much going in the pastoral areas. Um, into climate, we've got the um, we've got the outlooks. So we've got the maps of recent conditions. That so those maps that we were looking at earlier, all in there. So you can look at pasture average for this for April. April, you know, it's been hot and dry. There's you know less rain vegetation about than you might expect this this time of year. There's there's the climate data online that I mentioned earlier. We can put grab your station data. And on the Outlook page, we've got a few different things going on. Each month, we do an update to our, this, our video, which is a nice three to four minute summary of what's going on with the climate influence. You know, are we seeing El Nino, La Nina, in the ocean dive? A uh, neat, neat way to get a snapshot of what's going on. Um, uh, you, so on, on the Climate Outlooks, you go into the Climate Outlook page, and there are various maps and things on here for, say, rainfall, and this is where James got his map of May to, June, May to July rainfall that he was showing earlier. Um, now, the good thing is you can break it down by month. So what we're seeing at the moment is May is tending warmer and drier. Um, and then overall, actually June and July are looking, looking closer to average. Um, so looking for another, looking at another pretty warm, a pretty warm and relatively dry May. Um, but if you look through to say June, uh, that's much more average. So we've got the likelihood of exceeding median median temperatures on the on the right here. So with high likelihood, it's more likely to be above um, exceeding med the median temperatures. And if it's blue, it's less likely to be exceeding median temperatures. So it's really likely that May is going to be warmer than average. Now we can also look at the accuracy. So if you want to see, so James was talking about uh, outlook accuracy. How much confidence can you have in, in the outlook at the mo at, for this time of year? Um, there's lots of green in there, so that the higher the, 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 the green, higher the percent consistent value, the more confidence you can have in the outlook. So the fact of saying it's really likely to be warmer than average, and we've got and we've got a fair, fair degree of confidence in that, um, gives you yeah, gives you some confidence. It's it's going to be another warm month ahead of us for this time of year. So what that means is you know up for the, um, the pastoral areas, we are average temperature this time of year is typically around sort of the um, low to mid 20s. Um, you might actually crack a crack a few more a few more days into the into the low 30s, so 31, 32. Um, you might get a, uh, one or two days of that sort of conditions um, through through May, which is getting getting pretty unusual. Um, June, the confidence is still pretty good overall for May, June, July. Uh, but you know, essentially, what it's saying there's not a strong signal either way. So it's it's looking you know, looking about as likely to be warmer than average as as dry as cooler than average through June. Pretty much a similar sort of story overall for May to July. May to July. Uh, so um, that's that's how to get the best out of the app. Look, now you can click on the map um, and get get your get a get a um, outlook for the location that you're interested in. There is a low speed, low internet speed version as well so uh, we wanted to wanted to make life a little bit easier for people who don't have good internet so there's a print sort of print version um, that you can look at that's that's less stressful on your internet internet connection uh, and we have there's I will just finish with our climate page one thing I'll just highlight down the bottom here in, is the climate videos um, there's actually an interesting chart of 117 years of Australian rainfall it's worth worth a bit of a look as well We've got a whole heap of videos in here on various things that you can go and look at in your own time. So there's, we've got our, our outlook, outlook statements, annual summaries, um, but there's a few in, few things in there. Understanding the ocean dipole, understanding ENSO. So there's a few things in there that might be of interest uh, when you when you find yourself somewhere and you you've got a decent internet connection. So um, I might just uh, move back to the slides. So I just bring those back. So basically, uh, so one of the, one of the things you can look at on the on that El Nino La Nina page on the climate and past weather section is are these these model outlooks. So James is looking at that forecast of Nino 3.4. So that's that area out in the middle of, middle of the Pacific Ocean that we monitor in terms of um, when it's warmer than average. Um, that tells us where we're seeing El Nino conditions, and if it's cooler than average, that, that's we're seeing La Nina conditions. 
And at the moment, we're just seeing nothing much. It's all pretty neutral. We've got a, got forecasts here from a bunch of different modeling systems um, down the left-hand side. So the bureaus on the top, Canadian, European, Japanese, French, a couple of US ones in the UK Met Office. And we've got forecasts running over the next few months. So I'll go through to July, neutral, um, September. Got a couple of the models actually staying dead down a little bit towards El Nino, but not quite getting over thresholds. And so it's all looking pretty neutral from an Enzo perspective. And Indian Ocean Dipole on the bottom, we're actually seeing some weak to moderate indications of a shift out to negative IOD territory from three out of the six models. Okay, so we've got 50% of the models going into negative IOD um, and then starting to weaken a little bit in, into September. But So really that's about the clearest thing we can say at the moment. Um, we're at a time of year when the accuracy is not super brilliant. It starts to improve from here on. So once we get through end of May to June, we can start having a bit more confidence in these out in the what these models are saying. But at the moment, it's there's a little bit of weak moderate IOD influence, and that looks like it's behind that sort of wet, slightly sort of or in, basically neutral neutral winter conditions that you, that we were just looking at looking at in the outlook. Um, and then maybe some actually slightly wetter influence sneaking into the western parts of western parts of South Australia. So I've already done that and mentioned the climate videos that uh, you can look at. And there is actually a, a Comet MedEd course, which actually quite, you can actually work your way through in terms of getting the most of our outlook, outlooks, which is a free, it's a free online course through a, a US edu um, meteorological education system called Comet MedEd. So you can sign up and register for free and go through this whole range of information on there, including the Bureau stuff. Um, so that's well worth a look as well. Um, and spring, um, yeah, so continuing that sort of a um, little bit cooler in the northwest um, in terms of temperatures and a little bit of moisture sneaking in from the northwest with that sort of weakish negative IOD kind of influence. And all the stuff on the bottom, that's actually from an old slide um, from late last year. Sorry. Um, so yeah, to summarize all that, yeah, we've had a warmer and drier start to the year. Um, we're continuing to see warmer and drier conditions through May. Um, and we've spoken about those various climate influences. For South Australia, not, not so much James's part of the world, but South Australia, they're all, El Nino, Lene, and Indian Ocean Dipole are all really, really equally important. Um, so yeah, the IOD, Indian Ocean Dipole is a bit newer, but it's worth keeping, very much worth keeping an eye on. Um, Weak to moderate negative IOD looks like the main influence like um, this year, but we're still in a time of year when the accuracy is not brilliant. So I wouldn't, you know, I'd be a little bit cautious about sort of about leaping onto that one too hard. But yeah, warmer and drier at the moment, but it does look like it'll go, go closer to average through winter and spring. Maybe a little cooler and wetter in the northwest pastoral areas. And yeah, for the short term weather information, we've got Metai, we've got the bomb app. Um, so, and you know, if anyone does want to get in touch, um, one of the things we're doing at the moment, so James mentioned we've, we've just formed, um, formed middle of last year, formed a, an agricultural program, and a lot of my role is, is now involved with that. So, so uh, getting out and talking to people in different, different industries. Um, so we're keen to, to talk to people who are um, looking after livestock, um, different parts of the country, so work out uh, what are the, what are the, how, how we can better tailor what we're doing? Um, because a lot of our stuff is fairly broad brush. So we want to actually work out ways of tailoring that as, as James sort of touched on, ways of tailoring that better so people can actually make better decisions with it uh, for their part of the world. And also, we're also particularly interested, we're doing some work at the moment for a project that's, that's looking at how we, how will our forecast systems forecast extreme events that impact your industry. So we're looking at grains and we're looking at the pastoral industry and uh, viticulture as well. But if there's any particular uh, events that really stand out that have really, really whacked your business um, or even given you a, a really good, um, uh, a really good, um, uh, you know, brought in lots of cash into your operation, um, you know, whether it's frost or heat events or significant rain events or drought, um, yeah, let us know. So we're really keen to um, hear, hear, hear about that. So thanks for the time um, and happy to take some questions. Great, thanks Darren, no, it's really interesting. I think one thing that I certainly find that those of us that aren't 
uh, as scientific as you, sometimes the bomb site can be a little bit hard to decipher. So would you suggest for in that case that maybe the Met Eye is the best way or the best thing for, for most people to go to first? Certainly the app draws on the same forecast database that Met Eye does. So um, the Met Eye tool is just a way of, of looking, digging into the data, um, you know, looking at the maps and um, digging into the data a bit more. The app is drawing on the same forecast database, it's just more location based so you, you put in your location and it gives you the forecast for that that particular location so um, so yeah they're both they're both useful obviously the app when you're out and about and you've got decent mobile coverage um, you can look at the radar on the app um, once again if the you know if you've got the deep top got some reasonable phone coverage um, uh, but MetEye is is good if you've got a little bit of time you want to dig into a little bit more and look look at things look at maps and that sort of stuff as well that's that's really short focused on the short term and and then the other probably the other good thing is to put your go into the some of the web links and for the seasonal outlook on the climate past weather page and there's a subscribe button and you can just pop in your email email address for free and you'll get the latest Enzo wrap ups and and indulation dipole outlook um, so the subscribe button up here and you get the latest seasonal outlook as it gets updated twice a month. It'll come through into your email box as well. Uh, so that's a that, that's probably those things using MetEye, using the app um, when you can. Put your put your email into the subscribe button and, and sign up for things like the El Nino wrap up and the outlook information, and you'll get it all come through to you. Great advice. No, that's that's a great idea. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the other thing was, there's a question that's come in um, on, have you noticed that the rainfall over the last 12 months or so in the Midwest region of WA has been very patchy? For example, can, we can register 10 mils in the gauge at the homestead and three k's away, there is no evidence of any rain at all. Is this a changing pattern of rainfall and is there an explanation for this? Uh, yeah, it's not, a, it's not an easy. The, I sort of touched on the tropical activity that we've seen through, uh, through summer this year. Um, we had the very wet conditions in negative iodine in 2016, had a wet, wet summer. Um, and then it went through, we went through 2017 without really much going on in terms of major climate influences. Um, but then late in the year, it just started edging towards um, a very weak La Nina event. And so we declared a very weak La Nina event starting in December and that finished in March, but it really didn't do anything much. Um, and it was just really borderline. So it really didn't have much influence. Yeah, the thing that struck me is we had a reasonably strong tropical burst of tropical activity in late November, early December that I was talking about earlier. And then it just really, the tropical activity is just really weak, really patchy, and I think that's really what behind what's going on. Um, but it's actually, it, it's actually really hard to say whether, you know, what's 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 driving that. Um, yeah, there's there can be certainly summers where there's just it's, you get you get really quite regular bursts of tropical activity every four to six weeks, and 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 you you, you do see quite significant a number of quite significant rainfall events. Through through that sort of November to March period, um, just this 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 last sort of six or particularly last four months, that really hasn't been the case. It's just we're seeing some very weak activity, it's been really patchy, um, and it's yeah it's hard to be but hard to be predict, um, you know, from one summer to the next whether that's going to be the case or not. Unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and we've got another one here that says, do, do the bomb use analog years as part of their forecasting? No, not anymore. Uh, we used to. So um, up until about 10 years ago, we, um, yeah, f f five to 10 years ago, we were using, um, looking at past uh, currency surface temperatures patterns around, around Australia and through the, uh, through the Pacific and comparing those to past years and looking for, you know, using that as a guide, uh, statistically using that as a guide to what was expected through the season ahead. Now, this, uh, what was going on was because of, climate, because of climate change and global warming, warming of the oceans, we're actually getting less and less years available that look like, that we can actually find past, past years that are like, like what we're seeing. And so what we switched over to dynamic ocean atmosphere modeling, so we're using the POAMA model, so the Bureau's pre Predictive Ocean Atmosphere model for Australia. And that's, we've been using that for a few years now. 
but we're actually just about to switch to an updated seasonal outlook system called Access S. So as of the May, May seasonal outlook, the model that sits underneath the seasonal outlooks will be changing to a much higher resolution model with increased accuracy. So we're actually going to be incorporating some changes to the way the information is presented. So you can actually drill down to two week blocks um, and you know, look in more detail at what's going on um, in, in line with that sort of increasing accuracy with that Access S modelling system. So that's something to watch out for in the next month or so. Thank you, Darren. Um, and there's another one here that says, how do you incorporate past accuracy into long-term forecasts? So when you run up, when you start running a ocean atmosphere modelling system like POAMA or Access S, what the, what the researchers do is actually run that in what they call hindcast mode. So they basically run it as if you had that model back in say 1992, using the observations that are available at the time, and then use, and then run the model as if you were doing a forecast in say April 1992. And then they do, do the same thing for May 1992, June 1992, et cetera, all the way through up to the present. So you, so you can then compare what the forecasts were in the hindcast model um, compared to actually what happened. And that enables you to get those stats, that st the statistics that inform those accuracy maps that are the green maps that I was showing you earlier. And it's actually, it's actually quite, it takes a lot of supercomputing power to actually run all those time steps back into the past, do that. So it's actually a bit of, bit of, a, bit of a job to do, but it actually gives you, um, uh, gives you a, a pretty useful tool, uh, data set you can actually use to actually work out how accurate the model is. That's fantastic. All right. Well, thanks so much for that, um, Darren. It certainly is an incredibly interesting topic. I'm very aware of the fact that we've sort of run over a little bit of time, but again, it is it is something you just don't want to cut short. I'll take this time now to, to thank, thank you, Darren and, and James, for their time tonight and everyone else for attending. If you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to contact myself and I can certainly pass them on to James or Darren or or Jody, and we'll follow up um, as soon as we can. So on behalf of Primary Industries and Regions SA, AWI, SA Sheep Industry Fund, SA Arid Lands, NRM Board, and SA Murray Darling Basin NRM Board, thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening.